Good morning, Dr. Burt. You're joining us very early this morning for you. It's lunchtime on Sunday here. I'm Alison from Ames, and we wanted to talk to you uh, today about the upcoming STAR MS trials, as well as your book and a few other things. So I wondered if we could start perhaps by your telling us just a little bit about your background with HSCT and what you've done, as we've already said this morning, I think most people in the HSCT community, you're a very familiar face, but for those that are just coming to Star MS, it'd be really useful to hear a little bit about your background. Well, good morning, Alison. It's six o'clock in the morning here in America. Uh, it's nice to see you. Um, and thank you for um, asking me to uh, contribute here and help give information. Um, I'm the original pioneer of HSCT or hematopoietic stem cell transplant for multiple sclerosis and several autoimmune diseases. And it's an idea that occurred to me about 35 years ago. I was originally trained as a hematologist oncologist, but the idea, idea occurred to me while treating patients with leukemia, uh, having them come back to the outpatient clinic and having to re-immunize them for their childhood vaccines because they had lost their memory lymphocytic response to those uh, immunized antigens that they had as children. And I thought, well, that's exactly what you want to have happen in an autoimmune disease, not to an immunized antigen, but to your own self-antigen that your immune system has been attacking. And that started this process 35 years ago. Being a fellow at both the NIH and John Hopkins, I was young and idealistic. I thought I'd have all the answers in five years. Well, it doesn't work that way. It took a long time, and I had to spend 10 years in animal models as preclinical proof uh, because it was such a novel idea and would have kind of shocked uh, the field and met even more resistance without the animal preclinical proof of principle as well as immunologic analysis. So did that for 10 years, then finally was able to proceed into patients, and that resulted in phase one, phase two, and then a phase three randomized trial. That randomized trial was completed uh, and published in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, in uh, 2019. Uh, and to date, it's the only randomized trial that's been done. But the, the important thing to recognize is that this really is not a true stem cell therapy. In other words, the efficacy and the toxicity arises entirely from the conditioning regimen. The drugs you give over about four or five days before you infuse the stem cells, they ablate or knock down the old immune system that's causing disease. And then you regenerate a new immune system. Now, if it's non-myeloablative, you don't have to infuse stem cells. Your stem cells weren't hurt. They will make a new immune system on their own, as well as all the circulating cells in your blood. We, I only use non-myeloablative regimens because they're safer. And I give the stem cells that we collect before the conditioning regimen to accelerate recovery. It's just a wise precaution. You don't absolutely need to do it, but it shortens hospitalization by probably four days, which is a safety measure. And that's why we do it. So it's it's a the stem cell itself is just a blood transfusion, kind of like a surgeon who, before they take a gallbladder out, collects a patient's red blood cells, and then, you know, in the operating room, while they take the gallbladder out, they reinfuse them with their own red blood cells, so it can be an outpatient outpatient procedure, and they go home. It's really that same concept. It's a supportive blood product. The efficacy, and I have to emphasize this comes from the conditioning regimen as well as the toxicity and importantly, patient selection. Patient selection is key to success. And it is for every autoimmune disease and we've done several autoimmune diseases. Uh, and the regimen you use is different for different autoimmune diseases that's often perfected kind of through gut instinct and through trials. And then you figure out which is the best conditioning regimen. But all my regimens are non-myeloblative. What I found for multiple sclerosis is cyclophosphamide and ATG worked very well. And in the development from phase, you know, initial phase one, phase two to phase three trials, uh, we found that that was the best regimen before initiating the randomized trial. And then it was markedly superior to the best drug out there. And when you look at drug company trials, they compare their drug 
to either a placebo in the early days or now to a first-generation DMT disease-modifying therapy, such as interferon and copaxin. However, we took people, and these are in naive, untreated patients, we took heavily pretreated people who were having uh, at least two relapses in the last year, despite a first-generation DMT, or one relapse despite a second-generation DMT. So they'd already had a variety of different drugs, were still having uh, relatively frequent relapses, still had relapsing emitting MS, and we took them to transplant versus the best DMT out there of a different class, and uh, the most common DMT at that time that they were, got for comparison was natalizumab. That was before Lemtrada, it was before uh, Ocrevus or the anti-B cell antibodies, and natalizumab was the most potent and powerful one. And so that was comparison, about 60% had it. Some, of course, had already filled natalizumab, so they got a different DMT. But in any event, transplant was markedly superior in outcome. And it actually did something that no drug trial had ever done. It reversed neurologic disability. It did with a one-time treatment, it reversed neurologic disability. And we reported with five-year follow-up. I've recently written a, a medical textbook, 686 pages that came out. I was a senior editor a year ago, and now a lay book called Everyday Miracles for Patients. And in doing that, I went back and contacted patients I transplanted with MS 20 years ago, the longest it was 21 years ago, because, you know, patients came from all over the world or all over the country for our treatment. And after several years, certainly after five years, they stopped coming back. We stopped following them. But what I found is that these patients I was just randomly calling were still in remission, no MS drugs since the treatment, got better, stayed better, having great lives. And so I have their stories in there. And I've also come to realize I need to take the time to go back and to get all the patients back for you know, a final 10, 15, 20 year evaluation and a publication just on that. Yes, that would be very interesting. Very interesting. Because, You've given you know, me so I much. Of this, I have no idea that it would work like this. And, you know, that for me is just incredible. so incredible to have an idea 35 years ago and now to see this and then to be talking people 15, 20 years out, still in remission with no treatment, got better, have stayed better.